This is week 12 of our study, and we're into the 20th century, so we might as well wrap it up. Even though there's way too much going on in the 20th century uh, to cover in one class period. As I said before, you know, the farther you get into church history, the more things are happening. Because Christians are in more places, more numerous. So, and there's always something that you might regard as negative going on. Always something you could regard as positive going on. Church declining in one place, increasing in another place. And that's certainly the case in the 20th century as well. But let's begin and then we'll go over this real quick and see what lingering questions you have uh, related to church history. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day, the gift of our lives, the gift of grace and salvation. And for calling us into this family, this big story, this big, often messy, but beautiful story. Would you please continue to work in our own day? Thank you that you are always at work and have been graciously at work throughout the ages. Pray for a good class time together. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, Okay, so like I said, we're into the 20th century. So, you know, clear your minds and, you know, get in that frame of mind. A lot of things happening. Um, I'll try to be brief on each of these. Generally, when people think of the 20th century, they think of it as the beginning of it as this time of uh, scientific advancement, technological advancement, progress, things seeming to move really fast. Um, And it caused a lot of people to kind of have this sense of progress, right? Uh, That everything was just getting better and better. We were gonna have scientific breakthroughs, medical breakthroughs, uh, to keep making life easier for more and more people. Uh, For many people that, idea that science and technology would bring a kind of utopian society into existence, those uh, hopes or expectations were dashed with the two great wars, which wiped out, of course, generations of uh, people. Another thing about, one of the reasons, I mean, those are their own histories, right, that you could spend hours on, but one of the ways in which they're relevant to the history of the church is... In both world wars, you had historically Christian nations fighting against each other on on the different sides. um, And historically Protestant nations fighting against each other. That is to say, you know, uh, Christians in Germany and Christians in England and North America are still celebrating Christmas and Easter, you know, (laughs) together. They said the same Christian holidays, but um, it was also an age of where nationalisms are kind of bearing their full fruit. And so the allegiance to nation, people, uh, tribe become more important at times than faith. Of course, World War II results in the Holocaust, where we see sort of where this myth of science and technological progress can take us. We, we still have a heart problem. <laughs> like oh, we have all this technology and, all, and what we can do with it is we can kill more people. And we can cause more destruction than ever. Of course, there's the, the military industrial complex at that time is just massive, right? And powerful. And that's seen like in the, of course, the atomic bomb and things like that. Uh, of course, the Holocaust is this moment of uh, at least six million Jews being killed. And it's, that's not the only thing going on. You got Stalin, of course, who's, you know, oddly, you know, with the U.S. in the the World War, who's killing 20 million people, <laughs> you know, often targeting Christians. Um, so it's a, it's a messy historical time. But one of the reasons I bring up the Holocaust is because it led to this sort of exposure. It exposes something about the Christian church, especially in Germany at the time, right? So as you probably know, you World War II buffs out there, that many churches and Christians in Germany go along with the Third Reich, you know, they uh, kind of are willing to embrace the Nazi ideology because it appeals to their nationalistic sensibilities. Um, You can see images to this day of church altars with both crosses and swastikas on them, you know, as if the two symbols went together uh, without problem for for many people. Uh, Those are usually referred to as German Christians. Uh, the, the churches that went along with Hitler and the Nazis. But then there was a kind of a counter-church movement 
in the confessing church. The confessing church, it's kind of connected to all these people here, was a, was a protest movement among Christians that sought to uh, rescue and protect Jewish people in Germany, uh, sought to be faithful to the gospel and the message of Christ. At times they had to have like uh, secret meetings, like secret church meetings. They even eventually started a secret seminary to train pastors under Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, until the Gestapo shuts that down. <laughs> and so you had Christians kind of responding in different ways to these global conflicts, right? Some kind of go all in on it with their side, some protesting against it, uh, trying to do their best to be just and faithful Christians. It was a tough time, you know. Um, so speaking of those people, I want to spend a little bit more time on two of the people from this era, Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Right? Um, these are two of the most important theologians of the 20th century. Interestingly, both of them are there in that German context. Uh, Barth is actually Swiss, but he teaches in German universities. Of course, Bonhoeffer is German. Uh, you remember last week we started talking a little bit about how European and American universities were embracing a theological liberalism, like questioning all the historical Christian doctrines, re kind of recasting them, recalibrating them, moving in that liberal direction. Well, a lot of that comes to a halt with Karl Barth. Yeah, that's one of the reasons he's so important. He takes on the kind of elite scholarly establishment and is able to, using their own terms, undermine their system and reassert or reaffirm uh, orthodox teaching, like, like orthodox, faithful Christian teaching. His, his main works are called the Church Dogmatics, which doesn't sound like an exciting title, but it is <laughs> an important book. All right. Any of y'all heard of those before? Y'all heard of the Church Dogmatics? Uh, or Karl Barth? Okay. Yeah, the H is silent, just <laughs> as you pronounce his name. Uh, let me tell you so a little bit about him. So basically, he went, to, he went to university, a seminary. He was trained to be a pastor, but he was trained according to all the new liberal thinking, which was undermining everything, you know, denying the Trinity, denying the two natures of Jesus. Uh, it tended to be Unitarian kind of in nature. He, and so he becomes a pastor of this, like a rural pastor, and he starts realizing he has nothing to say to people. <laughs> that in his preaching and teaching of the Bible, he's like, there's no substance. All that training that he was getting just uh, was empty and kind of worthless. So he starts kind of going back to the, at that point, the old ideas of like God is Trinity. Why is that significant and important? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to say Jesus is divine and human and starts articulating the case for them once again. His first famous book is a commentary on Romans where he um, goes back to reading the text theologically, that is with reference to God. What does this text reveal about God, say about God, and what does that mean for our lives? And that commentary kind of fell like an explosive into the academic community of Germany at the time. People start to get excited again about orthodox belief, Creedal orthodoxy, That's, by that I mean affirming the creeds, like the Nicene Creed and such. And so this group of people come along uh, beside Bart and keep encouraging him to write um, and teach. And they, it's usually referred to as the neo-orthodoxy, the rise of the new orthodoxy. But it's more like a return to the old orthodoxy. But the reason why it's important is it just, it just cuts the steam, like that... Liberal theology engine had been running fast uh, in Europe and North America, and Bart comes in and <laughs> stops it, like keeps it from advancing, and then is able to undermine it to a large degree. So oftentimes, like when I teach the his Christian theology, we'll do a section on the history of theology, and there's this time where you get to the late 1800s, uh, or really starts in the 1700s, 1800s in Europe where theology starts to kind of crumble you know it's like it had been kind of on the rise and it's crumbling it's falling apart and then in sells uh, um, flies Dietrich, I mean uh, Karl Barth with like a big S on his chest like <laughs> rescuing the you know the academic discipline of theology from the pit 
and, and kind of restoring it back to uh, orthodoxy. Actually, these two together are really important theologians in the South African context. So when I was there working on the PhD, um, because they are framers of reform theology that come out of this struggle, this political struggle, and they're able to advocate for orthodox ideas. And that was similar, of course, in South Africa, uh, post-apartheid, people finding a way to advocate for an orthodox reform theology. Um, Bart loved Calvin. He wrote a book about Calvin, among his other <laughs> books. You might find that interesting. Because Bart was Swiss, he wasn't killed by the Nazis. He was just exiled. All right. <laughs> but they didn't like him. Uh, they definitely, he was definitely on uh, Hitler's radar. Um, so exiled. His younger associate is this guy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you were here. We did Bonhoeffer in the biographies class. So I won't rehash that whole thing now. Uh, but know about Bonhoeffer. So he's much younger. He is German. Uh, he comes from an, a, a very elite family. Bonhoeffer's father is the most well-known psychologist in uh, Europe and uh, far, far more famous at the time than the uh, younger um, – what's the famous German psychologist? Freud. Yeah, Freud. <laughs> Sigmund Freud was young, and the older Bonhoeffer thought he was misguided. So he, that's his family. They're not particularly religious, but Bonhoeffer feels drawn to study theology and join the church from a, from a young age, which he does. He was brilliant. He finishes his Ph.D. When he's about, by the time he's 21. Um, and in the German system, you actually have to write two dissertations to be a professor. You write one dissertation to get the degree and then another dis dissertation to show that you can teach at the university. All right, so... Dr. Bonhoeffer is doing both. He's a theology professor and a pastor. He spends a little bit of time in the, the U.S. Like, um, he, he moved here temporarily but found that the U.S. universities and seminaries were pretty shallow <laughs> theologically at the time. Um, and so he went, a, he went on a little tour of the U.S. and visited the South. And as when he was visiting the South, he visited a lot of African-American churches. And he said there is where he found true Christianity. And he's like people whose hearts were genuinely you know, committed to this. And he loved the spirituals, the songs they would sing, even made recordings of them that he would later take back to Germany and play for his students there. And it actually, it was the first time he had witnessed in the U.S. South. This is, the, again, the 1930s. 20s, 30s, 40s, that region, that time. It was the first time he kind of saw um, a, a kind of ethnic-based racism um, and a thriving faith community still in the midst of it. And that had a lot of validity for him, like a lot of integrity, that people could face this kind of hardship and still persevere in a genuine faith. So when he later goes back to Germany and sees another group of people suffering a kind of ethnic prejudice, um, he's going to be sensitive to that. It helps him actually be sympathetic to the Jewish situation. Um, Bonhoeffer, as I said, starts a secret seminary, um, writes some important books like The Cost of Discipleship, which you may have read before. Uh, he's written, he wrote a book on ethics. There's a lot more that could be said about him, um, but I, I need to move on. But they're interesting both in sort of setting the tone for what a vibrant faithful, orthodox, politically active Christian faith could look like. And they eventually have d different pro approaches. I mean, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer eventually gets involved in a, a secret plot to take out Hitler. And uh, he was sort of functioning as a double agent for a time. He's kind of, a, kind of spying on the Nazis. And th that was hard for him because he was committed to pacifism and nonviolence uh, in principle. But it had gotten to the point where he thought, what is the responsible Christian to do if an oppressor is just killing people? Um, and so he develops a kind of ethics of responsibility. That, um, so it's like typically Christians ought to pursue virtue. But what if you have a lot of uh, social power and someone else with social power is using it to hurt people. What should you do with that social power? So, you know, like Bonhoeffer's very connected, highly educated, has lots of social power, right? 
he, said, he starts to think, well, we got to do something to stop this person. Of course, it doesn't work. The plot is foiled, and Bonhoeffer is arrested, and he is hung uh, in the concentration camp two weeks before the end of the war. So, so he's usually regarded as a Christian martyr as well. Uh, Bart lives out his, his days, dies an old man. In the, he, he lived until the 60s, uh, the 1960s. He was born in the 1880s and li- lived into the 1960s. That's an interesting period of history. Lots of people like to study it, right? <laughs> you, know, you have your World War II people, you know, that really like to study that stuff. Uh, and that's good. What's, what else is going on in the world? Uh, there's the general sense of decolonization and contextual theologies that emerge. Let me explain what I mean by that. Of course, nations like to say the British Empire, you know, which spread the British Empire all over the world. The various uh, colonies start to gain independence from the empire steadily more uh, throughout the 20th century. Um, Often in that context, certain theologies would emerge, like an African-based theology or a Latin American um, liberation theology. But they kind of emerge out of that decolonizing context when they start starting to wonder, like they became Christians because of the colonizer, in part, but what does it mean for them to be, say, a Latin American Christian that's not Spanish Catholic or not British Anglican, you know, or not Dutch Reformed, you know? <laughs> so so they, those, they, those groups start writing books, and it's actually very interesting, even if it doesn't sound like it at first. That's interesting stuff. The rise of Pentecostalism, which we talked about last time, that really becomes the fastest growing. Christian movement in the 20th century. Um, started at, you know, in California, the Azusa Street revivals in the early 1900s, and then those groups start sending missionaries abroad. You eventually get your first Pentecostal denomination around 1914, I think. <coughs> yeah, the Assemblies of God start in 1914. That's the first technically Pentecostal denomination. But that, that trajectory continues. Have you guys ever heard of vineyard churches? You know, like the vineyard churches emerge out of this Pente- growing Pentecostal movement. Um, it's interesting. Vineyard churches like became very popular and were kind of all the rage, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then they kind of disappeared um, since then. Uh, since a guy named John Wimber was, was the starter of the vineyard churches, they're they were, they're charismatic slash Pentecostal type churches, but they don't look as much like uh, a church of God or assemblies of God. They were usually very contemporary in their worship. Um, was Keith Green, you remember Keith Green's music? You don't know that name? Uh, it was his kind of music that would inf- you know, be sung. Like they didn't emphasize all the showy, like speaking in tongues, you know, slain in the spirit kind of stuff that you might see at a church of God or assemblies of God worship service. But they still had those beliefs and praying for the gifts of the spirit to be operating uh, in their group. There's actually this whole history of Pentecostalism where um, vineyard churches are called third wave Pentecostalism. <laughs> I think the vineyards more than anything would emphasize uh, it was just calmer i should say you know uh, a calmer environment but oftentimes like if you've ever seen or heard uh, well the jesus people movement is is connected to the vineyard churches so like um, what was the movie called that recently came out uh, yeah yeah that movie um what's it called yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's more closely related to Calvary Chapel, but Calvary Chapel and Vineyard are very similar. You know, Calvary Chapel's distinctive is that it preaches through the Bible verse by verse, you know, but it has a lot of similar vibes. The ecumenical movement is another thing that happens in the 20th century. So you got Pentecostalism spreading. Um, and in, in, many, in some ways, almost every denomination to this day has been touched by the Pentecostal uh, movement in one way or another. You know, even if it's just kind of a more openness to the present work of the Spirit than many churches were 
pursuing at the, you know, before 1900. The ecumenical movement is where uh, many different denominations start trying to work together for things. So if you think about, and North America is a big part of this because since so many different expressions of Christianity start to thrive in America, um, you might think that would just be emphasizing differences. And it was at first. It was this reforming spirit that comes out of the Reformation, later advanced by the Puritans, like let's keep purifying the church so that every group, that new group that started was trying to keep reforming and purifying the church, like this desire to get the perfect group, the perfect church, the perfect community. You know, eventually I think that people start to feel that's not really happening. We've gotten too divided. We need to like cooperate, work together on some things. And that happens a lot more in the 20th century, and it happens today too. So um, it has all kinds of expressions. One of those expressions will be like at Vatican II, when the popes and John Paul II also will do this. Like we're Catholics, we'll start reaching out to Protestants saying, let's work together against secularism uh, or atheism. Um, in this case, the World Council of Churches starts in 1948. It's, it's something like 300 and, diff, 300 and something different national churches and denominations start working together for things like serving the poor, missions, evangelism, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> this is advanced even more by the Lausanne Congress in 1974. Any of you heard of this? At Lausanne, this is actually convened by Billy Graham. He's one of the main conveners. Billy Graham and his, kind of one of his British counterparts is a guy named John Stott. Have you heard the name John Stott? Uh, in many ways, they, were, they had the same sort of status in U U.S. and uh, U.K., respectively. And um, the Lausanne Congress made it its mission. Was like, Let's cooperate for the evangelization of the whole world. And so all the groups that come together for Hassan are uh, aiming to cooperate. Like, oh, like this is across denominational lines. Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Methodists, Lutherans. Let's, say, let's work together now to bring the gospel to the whole world. Uh, when it first started, there were uh, churches from 150 different countries that participated in Lausanne. Uh, to th today, there's over 200 who participate in this uh, Congress. The last meeting was in 2010 in Cape Town, actually. Um, and they developed the Cape Town commitment. And what's cool is they, um, the Lausanne Congress wrote a statement of faith that everybody agreed on. <laughs> like, all these different denominations all agreed on this, on this particular statement of faith. And it has a, a kind of a call to action. It's like, this is what we believe about God. And this is how we believe we should live. The call to action is about how we live. And everybody agreed to that one too. So <laughs> over 200 countries, Christians saying, we can actually agree on stuff rather than just dividing ourselves by our particularities again and again. So it's been a really powerful thing. I actually, I share this Cape Town um, statement of faith and call to action with my theology students. And I love to see their responses because many of them are, find it inspiring. Like the call to action part, they find inspiring. And they're like, right, these beliefs ought to lead to these kinds of actions. And it's not just about getting your beliefs right, but also how we live. I remember one student recently saying, when I read this, I was struck and thought, this is the kind of Christian I want to be. And this, this was actually someone who was kind of uh, frustrated with church and Christianity and was, you know, probably maybe on their way out the door. Uh, but going through the class and reading that was a helpful thing and like kind of re-engaging them, pulling them back in. So if you're looking for, a, a, you know, something good to read, <laughs> it's just called The Cape Town Commitment. It's produced by the second Lausanne Congress in 2010. And it shows that Protestants could agree with each other about stuff. So if you've ever thought that, well, once we started having denominations, it was just split, 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 you know, and the Christianity is just splintering. It's important to also recognize at the same time, you had these kinds of movements, which were bringing all kinds of Christians together. And whereas Protestants did like to define themselves by their distinctives, 
That is to say, the Presbyterians would write a statement of faith that say, this is what we believe and this is what makes us distinct from other groups. And the Lutherans would do the same, the Baptists would do the same. Um, now there's these movements saying, look, we have bigger enemies to fight than each other. So <laughs> let's come together and battle against other enemies, uh, spiritual forces at work in the world. So those are pretty cool things that happened in the 20th century. Um, another cool thing that happens in the 20th century is Vatican II. Um, so last time we looked at Vatican I that happened in the 1800s, and remember we said that was in part a Catholic response to Protestant liberalism. Like Protestants in Europe are going in this liberal direction, like throwing off historic beliefs, and the Catholics were like, we're going to hunker down and reemphasize our historic beliefs. We are not changing. We're not going anywhere, you know. <laughs> Um, we're not losing anything. Well, in Vatican II, the times have shifted, and you basically encounter a friendlier face from the Catholic Church in Vatican II. That is the first um, gathering. It's a Catholic, Roman Catholic gathering. They get together, and one of the things they just determine is that Catholics can have the Mass in their vernacular languages. So this is when, before that, it's always Latin Mass. You go to Mass, you go to church, it's all Latin. Most people can't understand it, but it didn't matter. That was considered the sacred language, you know. But after Vatican II, church, Catholic churches could have the Mass in their own local languages. So you get English, German, you know, French Masses. Uh, not only that, they uh, softened their approach to people outside the Catholic Church. So beforehand, the Roman Catholic Church was pretty insistent that the only hope of salvation is found within the Catholic Church and its sacramental system. At Vatican II, they were willing to acknowledge that Protestants were actually Christians. <laughs> right? So they were willing to acknowledge Protestants as fellow Christians, referring to them as separated brothers and sisters. Vatican II also kind of seeks to reach out to Jews and Muslims. Like other people who have a belief in one God. And of course, there's an organic relationship, familial relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Whether that's the case with Islam is, you know, an open question. But they were at least trying to reach out because they saw in the 60s the great enemy was the rise of secular atheism. And so from the Roman Catholic perspective, it was all of us who believe in the, this one God from the Abrahamic traditions ought to work together um, against secular atheism. Um, so Vatican II is kind of interesting. Um, it's still a little bit controversial within the Roman Catholic Church. You have like your traditionalist Roman Catholics and your sometimes called progressive Roman Catholics. And the traditionalists are the people who still want Latin Mass, you know, so, <laughs> and who think the Vatican II was too soft. You know, are y'all familiar with those? Some of any of those debates? You, know, you got any Latin Mass loving Catholic friends? You know. So uh, once again, this is also aimed at greater cooperation. So if uh, in the 17 and 1800, 1800s we're going to have more and more division, in the 20th century you should see a lot of that division seeking to be overcome through the ecumenical movement, Vatican II, you know, cooperation for world missions, etc. Does that make sense? Okay. In large part because of things like Pentecostalism and world missions, the 20th century sees a radical shift to the global south. The shift to the global south, by that I mean there are more Christians in the global south than the north. And by the global south I mean like South America, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, there's more Christians. At the end of the 20th century, there's more Christians in those parts of the world than there is in North America and Europe. All right. But at the start of the 20th century, there's more Christians in North America and Europe. It's a, it's, it's a massively rapid spread uh, in the 20th century. So, for instance, the continent of Africa, which has like 50 countries in it or something. I can't remember the precise number. 52 countries? Something. Anyway. Uh, it, it was something like 10% Christian in 1900 and by the end of the 20th century, it's 90% Christian. That's huge. 
Like that, that's a massive expansion of the gospel. Um, in yeah, largely missionaries. It begins that way, you know, uh, and then indigenous people, you know, take take the reins, and it spreads. Even in strange places, like of course you know, in China, it's been growing even underneath the nose of the communist government, um, such that there's a hundred million Christians or something in in China that you never hear much about. Um, even in Russia, so during after Stalin, who's basically against all Christianity, tries to eradicate it. Um, there's a 10-year period from like the 1940s and 50s where something like 90 million new Christians are baptized uh, in Russia. That's it's like wild. You don't expect And once again, underneath the communist regime, <laughs> which is you know, very much opposed to it, any of the unofficial versions. Now, of course... Russia is not part of the global south, but um, it's a place in the north where things were also happening. But Latin American Christianity spreads like crazy. I mean, um, virtually all of South America is majority Christian, either Catholic or Pentecostal, Africa and Asia Minor. <clears throat> so that's important. So because, you know, just living in our own society, you might think well, the church has just been in decline for 50, 60, 70 years or something. Um, and in Europe, it seems they call themselves post-Christian cultures over there, you know, many of the European states, nation states. Uh, and so it, you could get the sense that everything's getting worse and worse, you know, for Christians. Uh, you know, that less, fewer and fewer people are believing, fewer and fewer people go to church, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's only true in this part of the world. Like these other parts of the world, been exploding. You know. Oh yeah, they, they, they already do. do. Yeah, they definitely already do. Yeah, the great age of really the 1800s, early 1900s is when North America and Europe were sending more of the missionaries. Uh, I think it's less so now. South Korea actually is the second largest missionary sending country in the world. South Korea. <laughs> and it's like the size of I don't know, South Carolina? I don't, yeah. <laughs> Small country, sends lots of missionaries. You know. uh, I think this is very cool because uh, it's so easy to be sort of narrowly focused on our own sort of part of the world and not see what God is doing all over the world. You know, and you think about all those Christians. Like, for instance, you think about India, you think, oh, India is Hindu. Uh, but there's like 50 million Christians in India. Like, they're all over the place. And it's not who, ones who look like us. They're Indian. You know, like they're <laughs> native to the land. Christianity is everywhere. And has all, there's many faces to Christianity around the world. I think that's always helpful and encouraging to remember. I think I told you before, the, the largest Protestant body in the world is the Anglican Communion. And the Anglican Communion has 80 million Christians uh, worldwide. The majority Anglican person is an African woman. Let's say there's more African women in the church than any other demographic, you know, and that includes all of Europe, all of North America. You know. So the church often looks different, and there's there's more encouraging stuff going on <laughs> than we might uh, think. And it's even not even true in our own. Uh, Nation, You know, it's like we can't assume a cultural Christianity that maybe could have been assumed in previous generations. But uh, church attendance, conversions is still pretty good, pretty high, even in our own country. And um, there's probably fewer people who there's like obviously groups like uh, who would identify as atheists or nuns. Those groups are increasing, but so are the number of Christians. So these things are happening at the same time. I should say the Roman Catholic Church is part of the World Council of Churches, and they've probably sent visitors, like friendly visitors, to the Lausanne Congress, but are not necessarily a part of it. Um, the other thing I... Yes, sir? Talk about Latin Mass. Yeah. Do the Catholic schools, do they teach Latin anymore? They often do, yeah. They often, they often do? do, yeah. Okay. When I, when I have students who come from... Catholic schools in my classes, 
uh, they usually know some Latin um, and are even more familiar with just theology in general, <laughs> uh, which is always kind of interesting. Yeah, that's one of the few places where you can still get Latin and sometimes Greek, too, in these private Christian schools as if they're Catholic schools. Those are the main points I was going to emphasize. These are just some additional people I thought were interesting from the 20th century to comment on real quick. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, approach to thing is anchored in his Christian faith. And the, original, and the movement as led by him was <coughs> profoundly Christian in all of its language. Like you can see some of their documents for like rules for if you're going to hold a sit-in or a, a bus boycott or something like this. It's like these are, these, these are the rules for it. And it's all profoundly Christian. It's like you will, uh, put, you will seek to embody the person of Christ. You will pray to be full of the Holy Spirit. You will not retaliate. You know, <laughs> it's like all this kind of stuff rooted. I mean, he's an ordained ministry, specifically uh, drawing on his Christianity. Now, I, there was recently a, a famous uh, Reformed pastor who on social media or something tried to say that Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't a real Christian, you know, because he wasn't perfect. And it's, it's like, you can only say this in ignorance. You know, you, you can only say this if you have, you just don't know what's going on, you know. His letter to the, from the Birmingham jail is a letter written to pastors in the area, just calling them to truly embody their faith and, you know, help fight, uh, you know, against this system. Yeah, nobody's, no, nobody's perfect. None of these people are flawless saints. You know, they all may have an issue here or there. But you can't deny that that... I mean, there were certainly um, parts of the civil rights movement that were not motivated by Christianity, but MLK's part was. Similar with Desmond Tutu, his work, work in South Africa. Uh, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize at one point for his work on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a way of post-apartheid in South Africa. It's like, how can we, how can we survive this? How can we pull together as different races uh, without, you know, killing each other? And uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was uh, Desmond Tutu. So, have you you familiar with this name? I know you guys. Are familiar. <laughs> it's like, yes, that's right. He is Anglican uh, Bishop of South Africa, and um, of course he's kind of working. This is during the time of Mandela, and the Truth and Reconciliation brought together formerly former oppressors and oppressed together and said, you know, the only way we're going to move towards reconciliation and forgiveness is if we can also tell the truth about what happened, you know. And so we need to fully acknowledge the horror or the atrocities of apartheid in order for there to be the hope of healing. Like you can't just sweep this stuff under the rug, pretend like it never happened. Um, and he was instrumental in that, also driven by his faith of course, C.S. Lewis, everybody knows, right? <laughs> Lewis's impact on Christianity in the 20th century, probably the most famous public uh, apologist for Christianity with his mere Christianity and Narnia books, right? Uh, of course, the Billy Graham Crusades, that's the 20th century as well. So even though whatever else might be going on in the country during his time, there's still stadiums filling and <laughs> to hear Billy Graham, right? And... People coming to faith again and again. Uh, J. Gresham Machen, I thought he would just be interesting for Presbyterian history, since this is a Presbyterian church. J. Gresham Machen is a, uh, he was a Princeton the uh, Bible scholar, professor at Princeton. And um, Princeton was starting to move in that liberal theology direction. And Machen tried to stop that by articulating orthodox beliefs. Eventually, uh, the Presbyterian Church in the USA, which Princeton is a Presbyterian college. Did you know that? Um, it's, a, it's affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA. They were not going to budge. And so Machen left and started Westminster Theological Seminary along with some of his friends. And then they also started the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. That was the first Presbyterian split. So you had the Presbyterian USA uh, group mostly northern churches, and then the Orthodox Presbyterian Church splits off from it. This OPC eventually becomes the PCA, which is what Seven Hills is, the Presbyterian Church in America. Um, 
And then other inspiring figures like Mother Teresa. Uh, most people know of her, her service to the poor in Calcutta. And that's JP2 is John Paul II, who was a longtime pope, uh, 26 years, I think, from 78, 1978 to 2005, I think, <clears throat> that's when he died. Uh, there was a time when Billy Graham and John Paul II were both looked to as two of the like, most important Christian leaders in the world. And they were similar in their sort of open-heartedness to other people, like people outside their particular denomination and church. Um, John Paul also wrote really some really important theological works um, and generally gave the Catholic Church a kind of positive vibe in culture, I should say, a more positive vibe. <laughs> Because that was true even in America. Because, you know, in America there was uh, always suspicion. Uh, it was often suspicion towards Catholics because they were – their spiritual loyalty was to someone in Italy. And yet their national loyalties were to this country. And so that's why it was controversial even when John F. Kennedy became president because he was the first Catholic president and you know, people – the suspicions were, you know, being overcome gradually. Well, I don't know. What do you think? What are you thinking about? <laughs> what do you wonder about or have questions about still? 20th century church. If you were teaching this class, this is not the 20th century church, yeah. but if you were teaching this class in uh, 22, 24, what would your outline look like? What's your projection for the next couple hundred years? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, like projecting out. I do think that the ecumenical movement will continue to be important. I mean, even the emergence of so-called non-denominational churches as part of the ecumenical movement, it's a way to kind of overcome past divisions, uh, even though it's, they've become kind of their own brand, you know, so they kind of function like a denomination. But it's still part of this spirit to say, let's get past old grievances with each other as Christians and cooperate, work together for the kingdom. So more, there, more of that, I think, will keep happening, especially as the, uh, the spiritual enemies of the church become more prevalent. Christians of all different stripes will have to just bind together, work together, you know. I say sometimes to my students, you know, like uh, a Catholic and a, a Baptist, like say in Georgia, may feel like they're worlds apart. But if you take both of them and drop them in the middle of Baghdad or something, they're just two Christians, right? <laughs> <laughs> because to, their, to the surrounding culture, it's like, nope, you're, you guys are just two Christians. <laughs> and therefore, maybe the enemy or something, you know. So I think that'll happen. Um, there will be less cultural Christianity to depend on, you know, in the, uh, North America and Europe. Like just where you can just assume people have certain knowledge of or beliefs about God or what's good. So... Uh, I think Tim Keller used to say that both secularism and Christianity will continue to be on the rise. And as they both are on the rise, the differences will become more stark and there will be more conflict you know, between them, which will require, again, Christians to be together. Also, less cultural Christianity means less nominal Christianity. Nominal Christianity is people who are just Christians in name only, who just go through the motions but aren't serious about it. It'll become too hard to be like that, to be that sort of lukewarm, nominal Christian. You'll have to be all in or not. You know? so I'd predict that. More shifts, um, more countries becoming Christian countries, especially in the global south, you know, where Christianity will become more like the religion of the whole nation and stuff. Is Christianity like in Africa, is it pushing the Muslim to out or... Yes, it is a, it's still in conflict. Uh, in areas where there's large Muslim populations, it's in extreme conflict with Christianity. Right? Uh, but that's possible. But what, one side of that equation tends to be more warrior-like or violent than the other. So that's always going to be a reality. So, yeah. Well, it's almost 10, and uh, you've endured enough. So. <laughs>